This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marlo Diane. Forbidden Dragon. Blogspot. Dot com. Twenty thousand leagues under the seas by Jules Verne. First part. Chapter one, a runaway reef. The year eighteen sixty six was marked by a bizarre development, an unexplained and downright inexplicable phenomenon that surely no one has forgotten. Without getting into those rumors that upset civilians in the seaports, and derange the public mind even far inland. It must be said that professional seamen were especially alarmed. Traders, ship owners, captains of vessels, skippers, and master mariners from Europe and America, naval officers from every country, and at their heels the various national governments on these two continents, were all extremely disturbed by the business. In essence, over a period of time, several ships had encountered an enormous thing at sea, a long spindle-shaped object, sometimes giving off a phosphorescent glow, infinitely bigger and faster than any whale. The relevant data on this apparition, as recorded in various logbooks, agreed pretty closely as to the structure of the object or creature in question. Its unprecedented speed of movement, its startling locomotive power, and the unique vitality with which it seemed to be gifted. If it was a cetacean, it exceeded in bulk any whale previously classified by science. No naturalist, neither Cuvier nor Lacepede, neither Professor Dumerel nor Professor de Quatrefege, would have accepted the existence of such a monster sight unseen, specifically unseen by their own scientific eyes. Striking an average of observations taken at different times, rejecting those timid estimates that gave the object a length of two hundred feet, and ignoring those exaggerated views that saw it as a mile wide and three long, you could still assert that this phenomenal creature greatly exceeded the dimensions of anything then known to ichthyologists, if it existed at all. Now then, it did exist. This was an undeniable fact, and since the human mind dotes on objects of wonder, you can understand the worldwide excitement caused by this unearthly apparition. As for regulating it to the realm of fiction, that charge had to be dropped. In essence, on July 20, 1866, the steamer Governor Higgison, from the Calcutta and Burnack Steam Navigation Company, encountered this moving mass five miles off the eastern shores of Australia. Captain Baker at first thought he was in the presence of an unknown reef, he was even about to fix its exact position when two water sprouts shot out of this inexplicable object and sprang hissing into the air some one hundred and fifty feet. So, unless this reef was subject to the intermittent eruptions of a geyser, the Governor Higgison had fair and honest dealings with some aquatic mammal, until then unknown that could spurt from its blowholes water-spouts mixed with air and steam. Similar events were likewise observed in Pacific seas on July 23rd of the same year by the Christopher Columbus from the West India and Pacific Steam Navigation Company. Consequently, this extraordinary cetacean could transfer itself from one locality to another with startling swiftness. Since within an interval of just three days, the Governor Higginson and the Christopher Columbus had observed it at two positions on the charts, separated by a distance of more than seven hundred nautical leagues. Fifteen days later, and two thousand leagues farther, 
the Helvetia from the Campania Nationale, and the Shannon from the Royal Mail Line, running on opposite tacks in that part of the Atlantic lying between the United States and Europe, respectively signaled each other that the monster had been sighted. In latitude forty-two degrees, fifteen north, and latitude sixty degrees, thirty-five west, of the meridian of Greenwich. From their simultaneous observations, they were able to estimate the mammal's minimum length at more than three hundred and fifty English feet. This was because both the Shannon and Helvetia were of smaller dimensions, although each measured one hundred meters stem to stern. Now then, the biggest whales, those rorqueral whales that frequent the waterways of the Aleutian Islands, have never exceeded a length of fifty-six meters, if they reach even that. One after another, reports arrive that would profoundly affect public opinion. New observations taken by the transatlantic liner, Perrier, the Inman Line's Etna running afoul of the monster, an official report drawn up by the officers of the French frigate Normandy, Dead earnest reckonings obtained by the general staff of Commodore Fitzjames aboard the Lord Clyde. In light-hearted countries, people joked about this phenomenon, but such serious, practical countries as England, America, and Germany were deeply concerned. In every big city the monster was the latest rage. They sang about it in coffee-houses, they ridiculed it in the newspapers, they dramatized it in the theatres. The tabloids found it a fine opportunity for hatching all sorts of hoaxes. In those newspapers short of copy, you saw the reappearance of every gigantic imaginary creature, from Moby Dick, that dreadful white whale from high Arctic regions, to the stupendous kraken whose tentacles could entwine a five-hundred-ton craft and drag it to the ocean depths. They even reprinted reports from ancient times, the views of Aristotle and Pliny accepting the existence of such monsters. Then the Norwegian stories of Bishop Pontopidon, the narratives of Paul Egedid, and finally the reports of Captain Harrington, whose good faith is above suspicion, in which he claims he saw, while aboard the Castilian, in 1857, one of those enormous serpents that, until then, had frequented only the seas of France's old extremist newspaper, the Constitutionalist. An interminable debate then broke out between believers and skeptics in the scholarly societies and scientific journals. The monster question inflamed all minds. During this memorable campaign, journalists making a profession of science battled with those making a profession of wit, spilling waves of ink, and some of them even two or three drops of blood, since they went from sea serpents to the most offensive personal remarks. For six months the world seesawed. With inexhaustible zest the popular press took potshots at feature articles from the Geographic Institute of Brazil, the Royal Academy of Science in Berlin, the British Association, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., at discussions in the Indian Archipelago, in Cosmos, published by Father Moingo, in Peterman's Mithelligan, and at scientific chronicles in the great French and foreign newspapers. When the monster's detractors cited a saying by the botanist Linnaeus that nature doesn't make leaps, Witty writers in the popular periodicals parodied it, maintaining in essence that nature doesn't make lunatics, and ordering their contemporaries never to give the lie to nature by believing in krakens, sea serpents, moby dicks, and other all-out efforts from drunken seamen. Finally, in a much-feared satirical journal, an article by its most popular columnist finish off the monster for good, spurning it in the style of Hippolytus, repulsing the amorous advances of his stepmother Phaedra, and giving the creature its quietest, 
amid a universal burst of laughter. Wit had defeated science. During the first months of the year 1867, the question seemed to be buried, and it didn't seem due for resurrection when new facts were brought to the public's attention. But now it was no longer an issue of a scientific problem to be solved, but a quite real and serious danger to be avoided. The question took an entirely new turn. The monster again became an islet, rock, or reef, but a runaway reef, unfixed and elusive. On March 5, 1867, the Moravian from the Montreal Ocean Company, lying during the night in latitude 27 degrees 30 and longitude 72 degrees 15, ran its starboard quarter afoul of a rock marked on no charts on these waterways. Under the combined efforts of wind and 400 horsepower steam, it was traveling at a speed of 13 knots. Without the high quality of its hull, the Moravian would surely have split open from this collision, and gone down together with those 237 passengers it was bringing back from Canada. This accident happened around five o'clock in the morning, just as day was beginning to break. The officers on watch rushed to the craft's stern. They examined the ocean with such scrupulous care. They saw nothing except a strong eddy breaking three cable lengths out, as if those sheets of water had been violently churned. The site's exact bearings were taken, and the Moravian continued on course, apparently undamaged. Had it run afoul of an underwater rock, or the wreckage of some enormous derelict ship, they were unable to say. But when they examined its undersides in the service yard, they discovered that part of its keel had been smashed. This occurrence, extremely serious in itself, might perhaps have been forgotten like so many others, if three weeks later it hadn't been reenacted under identical conditions. Only, thanks to the nationality of the ship victimized by this new ramming, and thanks to the reputation of the company to which the ship belonged, the event caused an immense uproar. No one is unaware of the name of that famous English shipowner, Cunard. In 1840, this shrewd industrialist founded a postal service between Liverpool and Halifax, featuring three wooden ships with 400 horsepower paddle wheels and a burden of 1,162 metric tons. Eight years later, the company's assets were increased by four 650-horsepower ships at 1,820 metric tons, and in two more years by two other vessels of still greater power and tonnage. In 1853, the Cunard Company, whose mail-carrying charter had just been renewed, successfully added to its assets the Arabia, the Persia, the China, the Scotia, the Java, and the Russia, all ships of top speed. And after the Great Eastern, the biggest ever to plow the seas. So in 1867, this company owned twelve ships, eight with paddle wheels and four with propellers. If I give these highly condensed details, it is so everyone can fully understand the importance of this maritime transportation company, known the world over for its shrewd management. No transoceanic navigational undertaking had been conducted with more ability. No business dealings had been crowned with greater success. In twenty-six years, Cunard ships had made two thousand Atlantic crossings, without so much as a voyage cancelled, a delay recorded, a man, a craft, or even a letter lost. Accordingly, despite strong competition from France, passengers still chose the Cunard line in preference to all others, as can be seen in a recent survey of official documents. Given this, no one will be astonished at the uproar provoked by this accident, involving one of its finest steamers. On April thirteenth, 
1867, with a smooth sea and a moderate breeze, the Scotia lay in longitude fifteen degrees, twelve, and latitude forty-five degrees, thirty-seven. It was traveling at a speed of thirteen point four three knots, under the thrust of its one thousand horsepower engines. Its paddle wheels were churning the sea with perfect steadiness. It was then drawing six point seven meters of water, and displacing six thousand six hundred and twenty four cubic meters. At four seventeen in the afternoon, during a high tea for passengers gathered in the main lounge, a collision occurred, scarcely noticeable on the whole, affecting the Scotia's hull in that quarter a little astern of its port paddle wheel. The Scotia hadn't run afoul of something, it had been fouled, and by a cutting or perforated instrument rather than a blunt one. This encounter seemed so minor that nobody on board would have been disturbed by it, had it not been for the shouts of crewmen in the hold, who climbed on deck yelling, "'We're sinking! We're sinking!' At first the passengers were quite frightened, but Captain Anderson hastened to reassure them. In fact, there could be no immediate danger. Divided into seven compartments by watertight bulkheads, the Scotia could brave any leak with impunity. Captain Anderson immediately made his way into the hold. He discovered that the fifth compartment had been invaded by the sea, and the speed of this invasion proved that the leak was considerable. Fortunately, this compartment didn't contain the boilers, because their furnaces would have been abruptly extinguished. Captain Anderson called an immediate halt, and one of his sailors dived down to assess the damage. Within moments they had located a hole two meters in width on the steamer's underside. Such a leak could not be patched, and with its paddle wheels half swamped, the Scotia had no choice but to continue its voyage. By then it lay three hundred miles from Cape Clear, and after three days of delay that filled Liverpool with acute anxiety, it entered the company docks. The engineers then proceeded to inspect the Scotia, which had been put in dry dock. They couldn't believe their eyes. Two and a half meters below its water line, there gaped a symmetrical gash in the shape of an isosceles triangle. This breach in the sheet iron was so perfectly formed, no punch could have done a cleaner job of it. Consequently, it must have been produced by a perforating tool of uncommon toughness. Plus, after being launched with prodigious power, and then piercing four centimeters of sheet iron, this tool had needed to withdraw itself by a backward motion truly inexplicable. This was the last straw, and it resulted in arousing public passions all over again. Indeed, from this moment on, any maritime casualty without an established cause was charged to the monster's account. This outrageous animal had to shoulder responsibility for all derelict vessels, whose numbers were unfortunately considerable, since out of those three thousand ships whose losses are recorded annually at the Maritime Insurance Bureau, the figure for steam or sailing ships supposedly lost with all hands, in the absence of any news, amounts to at least two hundred. Now then, justly or unjustly, it was the monster who stood accused of their disappearance, and since, thanks to it, travel between the various continents had become more and more dangerous, the public spoke up, and demanded straight out that, at all cost, the seas be purged of this fearsome sedation. End of chapter 1 Recording by Marlo Diane March 17, 2006 Piscuit West, Prince Edward Island